Hi guys, welcome to our latest podcast today. Today I've got a really great guest coming on, um, Sue uh, Atkinson. So hi Sue, how are you? Oh, pretty good, AJ. Lovely to see your smiling face as always. Always lovely to catch up with you too. Sorry about the little technical difficulties we had earlier on. Oh, that's all right. It's usually a bit of a trick sometimes, isn't it? I know, I know. Hey, look, just before we do start, can you just let everybody know who you are and where you're from? Yep, I'm a Yorta Yorta woman and I've been living on the lands of the Wurundjeri Wurrung people all my life in Marybeck. So, I, oh. yeah, I grew up in Coburg and I'm now a resident in Brunswick. Yeah. So I've been here all my life. I'm really um, happy that the Wurundjeri Wurrung elders have been so supportive and welcoming welcoming of me over the decades, so I thank them for that. Yeah, and Brunswick's a beautiful place to live, isn't it? It's For people who don't know, it's it's so close to the city, but you don't feel like you're in the city. Yeah, well, our backyard um, looks onto a park. We've got about eight acres of parkland around us, so it's gorgeous with all the birds and the trees, et cetera. It's a wonderful little pocket. Holloway Road, most people don't know it because it's a one-way street. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Um, and how often do you get home to country, back to your, your country? Um, well, I try and get back every three months. I'm pretty reliant on other people because I'm not allowed, allowed to drive because of my medical conditions. But my daughter lives in Daniloquin. Yeah. So we always stop at off at Chuka on the way up to Denny, which is yeah. wonderful to reconnect. Yeah. And you were just up there recently too, weren't you? Yeah, we had a group birthday. The, the oh, nice. gathering of the Geminis. Ah. So there's me, my daughter, my grandson, and my stepdaughter. We all had our birthdays together. Oh, nice. And they're all basically in the same month? Within days of each other. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a good celebration to actually yeah, have. It's fantastic to be up there. Yeah. Now, you've been around, I don't want to say it sounds horrible, you've been around forever. You've been around for a long time in, in the industry, but you've been doing a lot of stuff with early childhood. Yeah. Well, I think I'm the first Indigenous person in Victoria to graduate as a kindergarten teacher. Yeah. Um, no one's challenged me on that so far, and I've been saying it for many years, so I assume that's correct. Yeah. So I did work as a kindergarten teacher for 10 years, and then I moved into TAFE and then into higher education. Yeah. And, and, you, and you created the... Um the possum skin you know, pedo, oh, I'm having oh, always yeah, had possum skin pedagogy. Yeah, pedagogy. That, yeah, that's been that was released. I think it was about 2017 in three parts. Yeah, so that came out of um, I started a group of volunteers up with you might, of course, you know, an ex a wonderful Colonel Wrong woman. Yeah. Um, in about 2009-ish, called APEC, Action on Aboriginal Perspectives in Early Childhood. So group of volunteers from across the early childhood sector and we eventually got funding to write the Possum Skin Pedagogy as one of our goals. Yeah. Did um, you know it was going to be as big as it's become? And so well used. The possum can, yeah, well, we did, we all started out at a meeting of APEC on um, Aboriginal and Islanders Children's Day. When Aunty Faye Muir came yeah. and spoke to us about the possum skin, how it was used by our people in the past and it has been uh, revived and how people are using it now in ceremony. And that started the whole conversation up about possum skins and the history and significance in our history and our culture and the survival of our culture and as a symbol of our culture, how it's used from birth to death. Yeah. 
and that's where the possum skin pedagogy document actually, <coughs> pardon me, started on that evening. Wow. Meeting led by the lovely Auntie Fane Muir. Wow, wow. And now it is a document that gets used quite a lot and gets referenced to quite a lot. Yeah, I, <coughs> because I've retired, I don't know what's going on with it out there, but um, because it's free, yeah, people can access it for free, I'm hoping that there's a lot of people who are using it. We've had a couple of workshops with the Department of Education over the last couple of years of people who are interested in learning more about it Yeah, around the seven narratives. So that's been successful. We've been um, well attended and people have been very respectful and enthusiastic and I think they've got a lot out of it because we've got kits now that go with the document. Yeah. So people can borrow those and actually see how to use those narratives in their programs. Have you seen a big change between when you were doing early childhood uh, to to now, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, well, when I started, we really had very few resources. Yeah. And those um, stereotypes of Aboriginality were very firmly in place about our people being only authentic if we were from up north or we had very dark skin. And yeah. it was assumed that in Victoria there was no real Indigenous people, that we were totally assimilated and had no culture of our own. So there was nothing to represent the mainstream took that view. There was nothing of us to represent in the classroom. And um, we've moved on a lot since the 70s. Now yeah. we've got conversations around in embedding Indigenous perspectives in the curriculum, people examining their own knowledge and their own um, what, how they can connect with their local communities to better represent local Victorian culture and I remember when my son was in school it was a real uphill battle um, they were asked to draw flags in class yeah and he drew the Abor Aboriginal flag and was then told it wasn't a real flag yeah. and it wasn't allowed and a lot of the time they were using those old colonial representations of Aboriginality in their classroom yeah. You know, people in lap laps and holding boomerangs and very dark skin. And um, so I spent quite a bit of time traipsing up and down to the school and talking to yeah. them about their curriculum. Yeah. And um, I think in the end I linked them up with VAI. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that was back in the 80s and noticed when my daughter went to high school. Yeah. We're a lot better. And now she's got her little one and he's had a welcome baby to country ceremony. Nice, nice. Yeah, and um, she's involved in the playgroup up there. Yeah. And they're uh, very aware of NADOC week. Yeah. And wanting to make sure that playgroup is um, welcoming and representative of all the Indigenous children who go there. Mm. And I asked her to um, participate in constructing that sort of um, program during NAIDOC week. And they have where my grandson goes to family daycare. That's a presence. It's not just for special days. Yeah. They yeah. Um, have the um, embedding of Indigenous perspectives in their program all year round. Yeah. So it's encouraging to see how much things have changed since the 70s. Yeah. When, when you went to high school, did you learn anything about Aboriginal people at all? Well, this is a wonderful story I've got. Yeah. When I went to high school, I had a black history teacher. Wow. I don't know whether she was Indigenous or not. I never asked and I was never told. But she taught about Aboriginal culture from a very different point of view about how people were dispossessed and all the atrocities that happened. Yeah. And I was amazed 
that she was actually talking about these things. Yeah. And, yeah, I think that was really inspiring. She really inspired me to learn more because I didn't know much about my culture when I was a teenager. Yeah. So that was wonderful. But apart from her, who left a great impression on me, there was, I don't remember anything. Oh, primary school? Yeah. Grade three? Uh, we did a project and we were shown what to do. We were told to draw an Aboriginal person who was black. Yeah. Who was wearing a lap lap and who was carrying a boomerang. And for some strange reason, mm -hmm. I kept that page. Really? Yeah, I thought one day I'm going to look at this again. It was really bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're also teaching us about how Aboriginal people um, just sat quietly under trees and died because they were sad. Oh, okay. I knew I was being told lies. Yeah. I was only eight. Yeah. But I, I didn't have the voice or the knowledge or the power to speak back. Yeah. So school was very strict in those days. Children were seen and not heard. Yeah. yeah. So now you're talking about it. I'm recalling quite a lot of things from the past. Yeah. I've um, going to ask you a question. Is growing up, did you have any role model, Aboriginal role models that you looked up to? Uh, Uncle Doug Nichols and Annie Glad and yeah. Uncle, uh, Auntie Pam Pedersen, who oh, I yeah. believe was a teacher or a teacher's aid at the beginning of her career. Um, I think I really got educated more thoroughly when I was in my 20s by people like Annie Iris Lovett, Gardner, the late and great Annie Iris, um, Annie Faye Carter, yeah. your elder, and um, Annie Joy Wanded Murphy. Mm. I think those three elders were really significant. Yeah. In helping me reclaim my identity. Yeah. Because I didn't know much about it when I was growing up. So it was a little bit of a secret. Yeah. But um, I did know a little bit. Mum used to talk a little bit about the mission and the old people. Yeah. So she didn't identify though. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think she wanted a lot of people to know about it because in those days it was a shameful thing. Yeah. Do you, because obviously you, 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 you've been, you identify and your kids identify. How has that changed since your mum's time? I think people are proud now. I think in mum's day people were feeling ashamed of being, she used to acknowledge her Maori heritage very proudly yeah but not her aboriginal heritage she did go back and forward to the mission until she was 15 yeah. when her grandma died she stopped going mm. so yeah i think there's a lot more people are a lot more um, excited and engaged and proud about their aboriginality and uh really um, active in the community and uh, standing up for social justice and wanting to see change and actually doing something about that. Yeah. 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 How do you define how Aboriginality? How do I define it? Or mm -hmm. how does... I think it's a connection, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't actually know I yeah. was Aboriginal, I thought... I was. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I sort of felt there was a connection there, but I wasn't quite sure to what. So yeah. I think it's that spiritual connection to clan and country that yeah. a lot of us um, are very grounded by and inspired by and live our life by, honouring clan and country and community and culture. And this year we've got uh, the NADOC themes for our elders. What does, what does this year's NADOC theme mean to you? Well, I think it's uh, really looking at the position of our elders in our communities, 
and thinking about how they've inspired us and taught us and continue to and how they've always been a really strong and inspirational part of our communities, the things that, especially the generation before me, mm-hmm. who've grown up on missions and the experiences they've had of oppression that they've talked to me about. I was thinking they've been very strong and they've survived and they've brought culture with them to us younger people. I think that's really important to acknowledge that and to recognise their tremendous part in keeping the culture strong. Have you noticed over time, like I remember when I was growing up, a lot of the stories I heard from the elders, they they were the victim of the story and now they're the heroes of the story, if that makes sense. Like there's been a shift in the narrative. Yeah. That's right, yeah. I remember one of the elders I spoke to said he used to hang his head down in shame when he was a teenager because he was a black fella. Um, Uncle Kevin, he's long past now, but he said the younger people now, the narrative's changed, that we're the survivors. We, we're victims, but we're also survivors. Yeah. We've been dispossessed, but we're also strong. We're also still here. Because the laws in place were basically there to outbreed us by now. We shouldn't be here. Oh, well, some people say we're not. Uh, <laughs> I've yeah. had, as you probably have had yourself, a lot of people challenge me because a lot of people think I'm Greek or Italian or Lebanese, Spanish, Indian even. Yeah. And when I say I'm Aboriginal, they go, no. Nah. How much, you know, what are you, a quarter? Who was it, your grandmother, your grandfather? Where where from? So they don't believe you. So they sort of dissect what you told them and ask you all sorts of intrusive questions mm-hmm. and basically reject what you're saying because you are fair of skin. Yeah. So I think us yeah. fair of skin people probably face that quite often, not so much. I think it's less now in the education community especially, but in the broader community that's still one of the um, stereotypes I think that we need to challenge. Yeah. I think in all my interviews with with young kids and adolescents, the, the the most common theme that they come up with about the racism they get is about their skin colour. So I, I still think it is really quite predominant. And especially when they go to services and they get asked that question, do you identify as being Aboriginal and Torres Strait As soon as they say yes, they go, we get a running commentary from whoever it is that's asked us that question. Like, really, you don't look at, oh, my God, how far back does it go? Yeah, that's a common line of interrogation, we'll call it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, what makes a good a good leader? Um, I'm just thinking of the people. Oh, I've got Uncle Jack Charles up on my screen here. The best oh, yeah. role is to be a role model. So I think he's an example of a good leader, someone who's got a vision yeah, and someone who's got a way of enacting that vision. He was always very respectful, I found, and listened to people. He was a gentle man, but he was very strong. Yeah. And he was very convicted and passionate about his Aboriginality and sharing his stories of struggle and survival with the Australian community. Yeah. Yeah. So in a small way, I think I was a leader when I, Annette and I established that APEC group of volunteers yeah. Um, being a kindergarten teacher, you like to be significant in the background. But we had a vision of embedding Aboriginal perspectives in early childhood spaces. So that was our vision. And I think that was really good as a quiet leader, we might say, to have yeah. a vision for the future. Yeah. And leaders don't always need to be up the front. 
to. Well, that's right. Know. Leading from behind. I think is that a is that a term you hear sometimes? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I often say sometimes to be a leader, sometimes a good leader might be someone to push somebody up the hill and and give them the platform to talk and even turn the spotlight on to them. Um, That's right, exactly. Exactly. So I think we had so many allies in our APEC group too. We all supported each other and listened to each other and learnt from each other. Yeah. What makes a good ally? Well, a good ally is someone who actively listens like the people we were talking about before who were saying, oh, you're not a real black fella, and you, you explain to them about your Aboriginality, they listen and then they go, but you're not a real black fella. I mean, a few of my friends who do talks have said that at the end of them people come up and still ask them about their Aboriginality. Like everything they've said is just washed over them. Yeah. So I think good allies listen. Yeah. They don't question you. They don't have these preformed ideas about um, those stereotypical concepts of Aboriginality. They don't bring that to the conversation. They're much more open and they care about social justice and they've educated themselves, right, you know, through all sorts of means. You can listen to elders on computers now or you can go to events, you can join in community circles. There's one here in Marybeck, the Sewing Sisters group who meets once or twice every two or three months with a group of allies. They talk about actions, like what have you done to challenge racism in your workplace? What would you like to do? How's it going? How's it working? What are the strategies? So... Yeah, allies listen. Yeah. And if someone wanted to join that group, how do they go about doing that? Um, I There's a website, which I can't remember what the name of it is at the moment, but I can send that to you. In fact, you could add it to the... The bottom of the link? Yeah, sure. Bottom of the link. And mostly people from um, Mary Beck itself, but also people outside Mary Beck are often welcome as well. Yeah. Now, Mary, you live in it. You live in in the um, where, where it is, Marybeck. So, for a lot of people that won't may not know, that used to be the the city of Moreland. Yeah, and before that, we were the city of Brunswick. Yes, yes. So when we changed from the city of Brunswick to the city of Moreland, no one made a fuss. No. When we changed from the city of Moreland to Marybeck, it was like the sky was falling in to some people. Yeah. Yeah. It's done. People are getting used to it. Yeah. So we did have a bit of pushback about that. Yeah. So even now, because has it been about a year since they've changed their name? I think it must be about a year. People were sent out. Um, we spoke to the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Council and they put forward two or three names. Yeah. People could vote on them and um, decide what name they preferred. Not changing it was not an option, and it, some people complained about that, but we didn't yeah. tend for that to be part of the process. Yeah. And so what, 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 was the, the preferred option from the people who voted. Yeah. So what does Mary Beck actually mean? I think it means stony ground, I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to have it. I'm a bit muddled. I've got MS and I've, my memory is very um, poor. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, I think it's stony ground, but Google it, people at home, just to make sure I'm telling you the truth. And I'll do some Google search and stick it into the, into the little briefing underneath the video. But you did mention your MS and you talk about your MS quite openly. Yeah, I didn't used to. No. Um, Because I've also got lupus and epilepsy. And sometimes when I was speaking in the past, I'd sort of stumble or forget where I was in terms of what I was saying. And one of the elders said to me, this is probably in early 1990, he said, just tell people what's wrong with you. Because I didn't want to. Yeah. So, I mean, I've had MS since I was 32. And I've had lupus since I was 20. Yeah. 
and I've had epilepsy all my life. So I think I've got away with looking pretty normal for quite a while. What do you think, AJ? You, you've always looked gorgeous to me. <laughs> <laughs> and who wants to be normal anyway, hey? Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, what is the normal? What is what is normal? That's right. Yeah. But what people don't understand just a little bit about MS is that it is uh, – people always think it's older people that get MS, but it's actually – you get diagnosed quite young, can't yeah. you? Yeah, mostly women in their 20s and 30s get diagnosed, even sometimes teenage, which would be very devastating. Yeah. Person. And there's different sorts of MS. So I've got the relapsing, remitting one, where I have – Times when I'm much sicker than others. Yeah. But some people uh, progress quite quickly to using a wheelchair or a motorised scooter to get around. And yeah. I had, that's why I couldn't work full time. So people ask me, I say I'm retired. So I've probably never been unretired because I haven't had a full time job since 1982. So maybe I've been retired for a long time than I think. But I know there's some people like you that retired is ret retired does not mean you cannot be somewhere, do something, be That's involved right. in something. Yeah, I was on about ten committees at one stage. Yeah, and you on any committees at the moment? Yep, I'm on the Mary Health one. I'm on the First Nations one at. The city Mary Bank? Yes. And one other, which I can't remember the name of at the moment, but that's the Sewing Sisters group that I advise them. Yeah. So, it's, um, yeah, because I won the Victorian Volunteer of the Year Award some years ago. Well, congratulations. Yeah, so it must be about six years ago when I was on the peak of my committee. Yes. You know, I got quite addicted to it, actually, because when you can't work, it's good to be able to do something productive. And yeah. If you're not well, you can't come to that meeting. It's fine. It doesn't cause any problems. Yeah. So I was trying to work out how long I've, I've known you. Oh. And I was thinking it has to be about 20 years now. Yeah. I met you at a Mary Community Health Professional Development Day. We were yeah. sitting around the table. I think, was that the first time I met you? Or? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Maybe about 20 years ago. Yeah, and I think that would be right. Yeah, you were about 21 at the time, I think. Oh, that's 30 years ago then. <laughs> it would have been, could have been 30 years ago because yeah. I've just turned 51. Sorry? You've just I've just turned 51. Oh, congratulations. So if it was 21, which is probably about right, it yeah. would be about 30 years. Yeah. Oh, my God, it's been that long. <laughs> oh, I think it goes so quickly, doesn't it? It does. It does. This thing called time moves. Yeah, and you don't even know it. No, no. So what is your, what is your five-year plan from here? Well, I'll keep going on my committees as long as I can. I do a tiny bit of writing here and there when I fast and probably just looking after my grandson, spending more time with him. Yeah. That's what I'd like to do. The kids said they'd move back to Melbourne at some stage, but that may or may not happen. So yeah. I'll keep going up there and spending as much time with him. He's my main focus at the moment. He's just gorgeous. Not prejudiced, am I? No, not at all. <laughs> No. Yeah, so I'm just, yeah, looking after my health too. That's very time-consuming. Lots of doctor's appointments, you know, time in hospital. Always yeah. in and out of the pharmacist. I think I keep the pharmacy industry alive and well. We are probably probably putting their, their grand, probably putting the pharmacist's children through uni. I'm sure I am. <laughs> I'm on about 15 different tablets now, so I think I'm doing keeping them going. Uh, so we give you a shake, your rattle. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What well, What do you think at the moment is the biggest issue for young people 
Aboriginal young people? Oh, that's hard for me to say, I guess, because I don't have a lot of contact with okay. people at the moment, but I know a lot of our kids are still in out-of-home care, still the stolen generations. People are being removed, I think, at greater rates than they were even when the Bringing Them Home report came out, as far as I know. Yeah. And um, also our young people in custody mm. and suicide rates amongst our young people too, I think, are, are much too high. Yeah. So mental health, I think, is a big issue. Uh, getting caught up in the juvenile injustice system, I think, is another one. Yeah. And then going to schools that perhaps don't recognise or value an Indigenous identity. I'm sure there's probably a few schools out there who may be run, not um, up to date with the thinking about embedding Indigenous perspectives in their curriculums, which should be across all curriculums, preschool right through to university. So yeah. do you know much about that, AJ, about secondary schools, for instance? Do they do a lot of embedding of perspectives? I, I think the, the issue at the moment, Sue, is that the, the teachers are still struggling to know how to embed. Yeah. It's become compulsory now for every, every subject to have in, like Indigenous perspectives, but teachers are not taught our history to start off with, and then they're not taught how to embed it without it becoming tokenistic. You know, like yeah. where does the maths teacher put it instead of just going, Johnny's got four boomerangs and Peter's got seven boomerangs, how many boomerangs are there? Yeah, very stereotypical, isn't it? Yeah, so I think teachers are still struggling to know where to actually embed and how to embed. Um and, there's, and to be honest with you, a lot of the teachers, when I go to some of the schools to teach, go, we don't even know Aboriginal history because we've never we've never been taught it. Just if the universities. I remember when I, back in the day, I used to teach a subject. It's called Koori and non Koori Histories. Yeah, yeah. People who were trained to be primary school teachers. But I don't know whether those sort of um, subjects are still in the curriculum at universities. Yeah. I'm finding that a lot of the universities, and I, I hope someone can actually, you know, help correct this as well if I am wrong, but a lot of them still might talk a little bit about history but still doesn't teach the impact that that history has on Aboriginal people today, which means that if even if it's at school and I'm in year 10, I'm a kid that's born in 2007, 2008, and you're telling me about the 1967 referendum if someone doesn't explain to me how that relates to me today or the, or the Aboriginal people today, I'm going to be looking at that teacher going, shit, that was years ago. That has nothing to do with me. Well, that's right. And a lot of teachers don't really know what it, oh, I don't know, I shouldn't say teachers, but people in the general public <coughs> about voting rights. Yeah. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about things like the referendum. And yeah. um, what was I going to say? I've lost my train of thought now. No, that's okay. But I was going to add, you know, like when, when I talk about the, the referendum, a lot of people do go, it was about voting, and I'm going, well, actually it was about um, being counted in the census that's and, right. and should the federal government be able to legislate on behalf of Aboriginal people. That's right, and people don't know that. No, and the people that affects the most are our elders in community right now because that's stuff that happened in their lifetime and you know when you hear elders talk and they go, I was six before I became recognised citizen in, the, in our country. What they're really telling you is they were born six or seven years before the 1967 referendum. And I don't think that the, the teachers understand how to explain impact, if that makes sense, which means kids still, still think this stuff is ancient history rather than yeah. much more recent history. Yeah, and what I've noticed too is some people say that the stolen generations were so long ago we should just get over it and don't understand the inter the intergenerational impact of trauma, which I think they're doing more studies on now. And it can be is it epigenetics? Yes. Trauma can actually be 
passed down through the generations genetically. Is that your understanding of that? It is, it is. And I think too because the people that still live that trauma are still here today. Yep. So part of transgenerational trauma is actually going to a family function and hearing about the missing uncle that's not there. Yeah. It's about hearing the stories of my grandmother or my mum that is still alive who are, who are not, they don't sit you down and go, hey, I want to sit down and traumatise you. It, I want to sit down and, and tell you exactly where I came from and where, my, where, where your grandmother came from. And it's those stories that continually get told and, and are still being heard. That's part of that growing up with the trauma, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it is frightening too to know that genetically that it can be passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of my girlfriends said, well, we might pass down trauma genetically, but we also pass down survival and strength. So I yeah. think it was a good, a good answer to that because those of us who've got children sometimes wonder whether that's happened in our families. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So it's um, a very complex scenario, isn't it, of what the impact of what people think is a distant past is on people today, including children. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, another comment I heard was that, um, oh, it's all right to be Aboriginal as long as you don't make a fuss about it. Um, if you do make a fuss about it, then you've attracted people like the Ku Klux Klan. So a version of look what you made me do. Mm. Yeah, we had the Ku Klux Klan turn up at Mary Beth. We were doing a smoking ceremony with Uncle Andrew Gardner. Yeah. On our survival day at the beginning of this year. And the Nazis turned up. Oh, uh, yeah big to toe in black and shouting racist slogans. Yeah. And um, there were children there and they were terrified and they were crying. And yeah. most of us were middle-aged or elderly women and some of our allies were very upset and were crying. So they're just such cowards. Yeah. But the police were already there before they arrived. Yeah. So I've never actually been confronted by Nazis before. No. I'm um, beginning to think this might be a growing trend in some parts of Australia. Yeah. People are more open about being a racist than they might have been. Yeah. I, I think with everything that's happening at the moment with Treaty, with vo The Voice, I've seen, I think we've all started to see the the comment, the racist comments and thought processes. And sometimes it shocks you a little bit about some of the people that I hang, hang around with or even on my Facebook or my LinkedIn accounts that normally follow me, but just some of the comments that have thrown me and going, oh, my God, I wouldn't have believed this person had those thoughts. Yeah, it's very telling, isn't it, what these debates bring out in people. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm quite pessimistic about the outcome of the referendum. Yeah. And um, I hear that support's falling for yeah. the voice. So I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't pass. I, I feel a bit, a bit the same. I... I I don't know whether or not it will pass or not. In in some ways, uh, I, I want it to pass um, because, you know, obviously the change and everything, but I don't know if our society from where it sits right at the moment will will allow it to pass, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's a lot of pushback against it from various corners of community, so yeah. it's... Um, as you say, it's brought a lot of the racists out of the woodwork and people you wouldn't never expect to say those things, especially knowing who you are. Yeah. They, maybe they feel emboldened by some of the conversations around us, perhaps. 
Yeah. And there's a difference between having a conversation. Sorry, there is a difference between having a conversation and having some of the racist comments thrown into that conversation. Yep. Yeah, that's not a conversation. That's just, what do they call it, slander? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's not a conversation. It's a statement of racism. Yeah. But you'd be surprised to hear this, that um, I've been on... I look at some of those comments, even though I've been te- I've been told by people who don't because it can be upsetting. But I click on some of their profiles, and the majority of their profiles are made up profiles, but some of them are actually list exactly who they are, where they work, really? what their profession is. Um, and I've seen that some of them have been teachers and nurses and doctors and lawyers and. Um, and I've been screenshotting some of those comments and sending them to employers to show their employer these are the comments that are being made by staff. And especially if I can hop onto their workplace website and see that they've got a reconciliation action plan or something, I've been able to go, well, I think there has to be a lot more work in your organisation if people are putting these comments on and uh, openly stating where they do work and it's listed you as their employer, this is a concern. What sort of responses have you had? Um, Most of it starts off with, I don't think it could be any of our staff, is the first response. But, you know, with trolls anyway, that it's not just one comment, there's a a list. So a lot of workplaces have, it's one way of getting a good job because I've been able to actually um, come in and do more work with with the organisation. But I've also sent them off to um, like APRA, for example, you know, the licensing bodies and um, the Australian Association of Social Work, if they're a member, where people have been investigated and you get an outcome report at the end saying the person's had uh, conditions put against their practice and they have to go and do a certain amount of hours around cultural awareness. And it's quite a huge number. It's not just like do do a half-day session. It's like do 50 hours or something. Yeah. Well, they'd need at least 50 hours to challenge some of their ideology, wouldn't they? Yes, yes. But I, I go, in my position of me doing a lot of training, if I'm working with organisations like early childhood and health and community services, if I'm seeing the workers make those comments, I'm going to start holding people accountable for those comments. Yeah, because what's the legal position of people making racist remarks online? Is there a... Mm. I don't know whether that's something that you can actually action and take people to court through. I don't know. No. Well, the interesting thing is people talk about we've got fr- freedom of speech laws. We don't have freedom. Like, it's not like America where we, but we do have laws that can't incite violence. We do have laws that can't have racist comments or sexist comments. But the hardest part is, is that we don't, take people to court over a lot of those comments, if that makes sense. And it's really hard to actually prove when you're talking to a troll. Yeah, and, of course, taking people to court is very difficult because then you've got to have the money to do it. Yes. And, and it would be very emotionally upsetting too to go through that process, I think, for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. But it's, it's shown me how racist Australia can really be. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, if you look at what we were talking about earlier, that Australia was founded on a racist premise, wasn't it, that we were dispossessed and inferior and people yeah. have been, um, look at the um, statistics for health and education and employment and incarceration and black deaths in custody, they're all much higher. Yeah, and they get higher every year. They're the ones that are not closing the gap at all. Yeah, there's a few. I think preschool is one that looked pretty good. Yes, and getting kids to year 12 as well. Yeah, that's improving slowly, isn't it, in certain states and not others? Is yes. Correct. Yes. So we are seeing some of the good things occur. Yes. And, um, you know, some of these gaps are not going to close in in my lifetime, if that makes sense. It does. It does. 
they're not gaps. I think it's a word that's bigger than that. What is it? A gap. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> uh, I think our prime minister called it a. a, 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 a I think he said in it's like, like a chisholm. Oh, it's yeah. Big, yeah, it's yeah. A chisholm. yeah. Yeah. So it's going to take hundreds of years to address that because it's been yeah. going on for hundreds of years. Yeah. I've got faith, I must say, in the early childhood community from my experiences. There are some beautiful programs out there. People are respectful and listening and are really committed to social justice and making sure. First Nations voices are heard and respected and represented in their programs. So, yeah, you know, your early childhood. Yeah. I'm on a lot of early childhood forums and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions that people are asking and they're not scared to ask the questions, but sometimes they're scared of the answers that they get. There's still a little bit of, oh, I thought I was doing the right thing and, and yeah. I should be talking to elders. And I'm going, there's a difference between talking to elders about getting information, but you don't need to talk to elders about every single decision that you make in your in your early childhood service. No, not at all. You're the professional. Educate yourself and go forward. Listen to the elders online if you want to. Yeah. Just sometimes, you know, write a letter to your local land council and let them know what you're doing in your program. You're having acknowledgement of country every morning or that's yeah. something people would like to know that was happening in there. Area too, I think. Yeah. Well, I am watching the time, and I know oh, that yeah. you're really busy. But I want to, oh, I want to yeah. yeah. add just to ask you two more little questions. The first one is, um, what do you think would be advice you would give young Aboriginal people that want to know more about culture? Uh, talk to their elders. This is the thing I was told when I was younger. Talk to your elders, listen to their stories, take their advice and see that they're role models. Yeah. Find a role model. Not might not be your grandma. Your grandma might have passed on, but there's someone in the family I'm sure that people can really strongly connect to and finding a role model I think is really inspirational. I mean, that's what did it for me. Yeah. I think I would have been lost without those role models. But you've got to be prepared to listen. I mean, when I was young, I didn't. Yeah. And, uh, when mum used to tell me a few things, I just thought, hmm, nah, you know, chatter, 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 chatter. I didn't listen. <laughs> Took no notice and now I regret it. Yeah. So yeah. I think, yeah. Being and participating in community events, I think it's always important too for young people. Yeah. Um, I think people come away from things feeling inspired and stronger, and especially during NADOC week, there's so much on. Which yeah. has been confirmed, and people can go away feeling really inspired by what they're seeing and what people are doing around them. So yeah. getting involved well, in the community, if you're not, yeah. What's your plans? What, what are you doing during NATO week? I am disappointed because we were supposed to be going to the ball, but it's not happening. But oh. I'll probably just be watching online and seeing what people are doing. So this year, for the first time, I think I've been to the ball every year since, or almost every year since 1973. Yeah. And I saw you last year at the ball. Yes, you came and sat. That was a very crowded room, wasn't it? It was a very crowded room. And the lights were very low and I couldn't see what I was eating, but maybe <laughs> that's a good <laughs> Yes. And we were down the back. We were down the back of the, 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 the I was going to say chamber, the back of the... It wasn't <laughs> the chamber in Parliament again. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was like we were way down the back. And it was huge, wasn't it? It's just... Grown so much, which is I think it's a good thing. And but there's also smaller events like in Melton. Yeah. And be a ball in Melton this year. And sometimes those smaller events are more comfortable for people who don't like huge crowds and packed venues and a lot of noise and yeah, so it's good. Yeah. I used to go on the march every year. 
Yes, yes. But, um, yes, I'll be observing from afar, I think. Yeah. And my final question is, what would you like listeners to get out of our conversation today? What would you like them to walk away with? Well, challenge some of the stereotypes. We've been talking about stereotypes, haven't we? We have, we have. I think um, think about how you can challenge those stereotypes within your own mind. Um, perhaps educate yourself a bit further. And then when you feel confident enough, perhaps you can challenge people in your own circles. Yeah. Or people who tell racist jokes. You can say, well, what's funny about that? Mm. So I think challenging people within your own circles, sometimes you're surprised at what people were saying, like you were saying, AJ, and also in your workplace. Yeah, yeah. Um, challenge people's um, thoughts about Aboriginality. The one I heard most recently was that people identify to get the brand new car. Yes, all that free stuff that we get. I know. I'm glad I didn't have to buy a house. Did you know that? I was given a house, absolutely. Yeah, new car. Yeah, all those sort of things. So education. Yeah, so I think once you educate yourself, you can actually go out and challenge people about their attitudes wherever you may be. And if you're a parent in the preschool or primary school, educate yourself and you know, talk to the teachers about what they're doing in their programs, about Indigenous inclusion, no, things like that. I think are important. Have those conversations. Yeah, no, I think that's a good thing. It's about having conversations. Yeah, even if they're a bit tricky. Yeah. You practice what you're going to say before you turn up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stay calm while you're having those conversations. Yes, yes. I think it's uh, important not to show too much anger because people step back from you straight away then, don't they? rather than engage with you. I do. Well, I want to say thank you for hanging with me this mo this morning and I'm sure our listeners will um, no doubt put some comments into the into the feedback when it comes out. But yeah. I want to say, I, I, look, I've known you for, like I said, 30 years. You've been an inspiration to me as well and I really love the work that you've been, that you've done and that you still continue to do. So Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, AJ. For um, everything. And I want to say just thank you to our listeners, and I'll see you guys next time. Okay. Thank you, AJ. Bye. Take care.